the behavior support plan, you take all of the information that you had gathered um, and uh, from your hypothesis you start generating those interventions. And we really like to put support plans in place that are, are very clear and definitive for staff um, consistency. And so, you know, when you see this, this is uh, your intervention uh, in, in supporting the student. And we often do it um, in levels of you know, kind of proactively, what do we need to have in place for that student even prior to um, us ever seeing behavior? Because oftentimes, you know, the, the environmental factors, um, you know, sleep, uh, okay. individual students' primary needs, you know, we need to address those. But then when we do start seeing the student's escalation of behavior, there's oftentimes, you know, triggers that we identify in behavior plans and really kind of going through that model of, you know, when we start seeing this, this is what we need to do. And what we have found is that, you know, staff in general do much better, much better with a very specific plan. Um, and you get much greater consistency when people have an understanding of, if I see this, this is what I do. If it's starting to escalate a little bit, this is what I do. And so it kind of goes through um, the different components of how we want staff to be um, supporting those individuals um, through a, a really decisive plan. I think everybody does better when there's a really good plan in place. Um, and we absolutely believe, you know, in proactive strategies um, being the main components of plans as opposed to reactive strategies. Because when we're only um, in the mode of reacting to students' behavior, um, we're so far behind the game. Um, when you put you know, the, the big chunks of your support proactively, oftentimes we greatly eliminate um, the need for any kind of reactive intervention, which is what we want for students. And some of the most important proactive supports are going to be looking at developing replacement behaviors. Um, because once we've identified the function of the student behavior, usually the function is very reasonable. Um, you know, we hear about attention being a function all the time, and people tend to view attention as being a bad I function. But, you know, there really isn't anything wrong with wanting a little bit of attention and positive attention and reinforcement. Um, it's just that sometimes how individuals go about getting the attention that they need is a little bit undesired sometimes. And so um, once we have that function, our job isn't to say, well, <laughs> too bad, <laughs> that's too much attention. So our job isn't to say, well, that function isn't valid. It's to look at that function and then find ways, alternate ways the student can have that need met. And um, that involves teaching them replacement behaviors. And when you're looking at replacement behaviors, you need to decide whether or not um, the student has a skill deficit or a performance deficit. And that is a very important part of the process. It's a skill deficit is when the student actually doesn't have the capability at the moment to perform the skill at all. So they don't have another way to ask for attention. So maybe the student is nonverbal and they don't have a communication system that has social um, phrases that they can use with their peers. So instead, they are going up and poking their peers in order to have some kind of, a, or tickling their peers in order to have some kind of a social interaction. So in that scenario, it's something that the student doesn't have any access to. They don't have that skill right now. So we have to teach a specific skill. Um, when it's a performance deficit, the student has the skill they have the capacity to demonstrate it, they're able to demonstrate it. You might even see them demonstrating it in some settings, but for some reason, whether it be motivational factors, whether it be um, understanding of when and why, but for some reason they're not performing that behavior in some setting. And so depending on your answer to that question, your intervention will be different um, because if it's a performance deficit, you are going to be looking more at some psychoeducation around the skill um, and possible reinforcement of the skill, 
Whereas if it's a, an actual skill deficit, you need to be looking at teaching the actual skill and, and how to do that skill. We also um, in, take into consideration you know, positive interventions um, and interactions, really looking at um, those components. And then as Lisa was saying before, those consequence strategies. And we're not always talking, or you know, mostly not talking about um, aversive uh, you know, punishment. Intervent, interventions, right. punishment, but just, you know, what do we do after the behavior has occurred? You know, what, what is the environment um, going to be like? So once we've seen the behavior, then what is the response? And that can be many different things. Um, kind of in an escalation of the behavior we see. And then if needed, as I was talking before, um, in developing uh, a really comprehensive behavior support plan, sometimes we may need a behavior response plan. So if a, a heightened behavior that requires um, intervention, what are people supposed to do? So for an example, if you have you know, high rates of aggression and where safety is really concern, a concern, um, we, we may need a response plan in, you know, is there a crisis team that's going to be called and how is that done? Um, you know, do uh, individuals uh, in the building need to have a means of communication to one another? Are you going to use an intercom system? Who's going to come? And then once they come, what is their role um, in providing support? Um, what we don't want to happen is, you know, for crisis teams, for you know, uh, five or six different people from the building come and, and kind of um, engulf the student. We really want to clearly define in having a crisis team who are those individuals, what is their response, um, what is their interaction with the student going to be, and kind of you know really explicitly um, detail that out um, so that people know what their roles are um, in supporting that student. So it's okay to have a behavior support plan and then also a behavior resource plan uh, which is there specifically to address when the student gets to a, a point of um, possible uh, aggr potential aggression or something like that where threat of harm to self or others. So I, I think that's an important point to note that there are the two components that mm -hmm. are there um, and that that doesn't need to all be built into one specific plan as, as this big hierarchy you can have two separate plans to address those conditions. Absolutely. Um, you, you'd mentioned uh, proactive approaches to behavior. In my observations uh, as a director over the last uh, number of years, there seems to be more uh, students with sensory needs. Um, we know that we've increased in autism and other health impaired in the state. Uh, with diagnosis, but it, in reading through uh, the IEPs and, and sitting in on meetings and observing children, there seems to be, again, this increase both in objective and I think in the subjective observation of sensory. So is that a proactive strategy to build some sensory time and maybe what does that look like? If the, Should that be considered or is it, well, sensory, that's more of an occupational therapist role, or that's more of an OT role. Uh, I think people get fuzzy on, on that. What are your experiences? Well, sensory seeking or avoidance definitely can be a function of a student's behavior. And so if you, if you have some data to show that, or doing your direct observations, you're finding that you believe that that is part of the reason why a student's engaging in a behavior, we would definitely recommend pulling in your occupational therapist if they are not already on board with the functional behavior assessment team. Um, because they might have some specific assessment tools, such as the sensory profile, that can help to identify where the specific needs lie for the student. And then in regards to the question of whether sensory should be proactive, um, Sensory supports are usually both proactive and responsive, so there are definite things that we can do once we understand um, where a student's sensory needs lie. There's definitely proactive things we can do. So for example, if fluorescent lighting is a problem for the student, we can have natural lighting or um, alter the lighting in a, in a setting so that it's not aversive to a student. Or we can put tennis balls on the chairs and the desks so that if noise is an issue, that kind of scraping on the floor isn't going to be affecting the student anymore. Um, so there are many proactive things we can do to the environment, but also proactively just 
having sensory opportunities in kind of scheduled throughout the student's day, which is usually referred to as a sensory diet. Um, and then responsively, if we you know, see that we believe a student is becoming dysregulated on a sensory level, you also can provide sensory supports as part of that behavior response plan in addition. So they can be both proactive and, and responsive. And I would say we're definitely seeing that increase in students with sensory needs across the board and there's some research to show that as well that they may very well be students that are not identified with any mm -hmm. um, diagnosis or label they just are more sensitive to sensory input than other individuals and I think we're seeing more and more as well is that you know proactively when teachers are inserting more movement breaks or more opportunities for students um, how their learning takes place whether they're sitting in a desk or lying propped up on a floor or reading in a quiet corner that those proactive strategies all all students within the classroom are really benefiting from um, some of the things that we know are very helpful for our students with autism for our students with attention um, deficits. Uh, so proactively there's a lot that's, that teachers can do just as classroom-wide supports um, that can really reduce or eliminate um, the behaviors. And there's a lot of research out that are supporting, you know, we go into classrooms all the time where they have options for seating. We'll see students that are sitting on balls or, you know, have um, the move and sit cushions. And not just students, like Lisa said, that have been identified, but we're you know, starting to understand more about all students and how they're learning and how important movement is. Um, we're also seeing that in, you know, some school districts, uh, we're really having to get um, the planning around a school day, and so we're seeing the elimination of some recess times or kind of how um, the, the options for physical education um, you know, with budget cuts and, and certain things like that. And so I think teachers are getting so much more creative um, around how they provide those opportunities proactively for their students because they see such great benefit. I don't have anything else. I, I've had my questions answered. Well, one thing, David, I okay. was thinking that you haven't asked. You can ask us um, if functional behavior assessments are only for students in special education. That is that is a good question. Um, can we do it for some uh, somebody who doesn't have an IEP for a student in regular education or not? Does it make sense? To, how, Absolutely, what, we can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll take you back to that yeah. rule of three. So if yes. you have a student in the general ed population that doesn't have an IEP, but they have a behavior that meets that rule of three, um, you know, a lot of districts have kind of a intervention type team or process that students go through before they end up being referred for special education. And we really advocate for, you know, at least brief FBAs to be done as part of those intervention teams because you might have students that really just need somebody to take a look at what their needs are, what that function is, and put some supports in place, and it may eliminate their need for more intensive services. So we do recommend that we want to inform a parent that we're doing yes. an FBA and get their involvement, but a student does not have to be in special education in order to have an FBA done. That's kind of a myth that some people mm -hmm. think is, is true, so yeah, well, it, that it's required. And Lisa, going back to just a few minutes ago, um, your statement about class-wide interventions, things that can be available for students, uh, any students who want to maybe use a ball chair or a standing desk. I do think there is, and, and it does seem to be, to be going away, but there is a perception that um, you can only do certain things for certain students versus more of a universal design approach uh, and differentiated instruction we've heard about and differentiated classroom we probably haven't heard as much about. Uh, but that is, that's a terrific point to make that environment have a lot of the different resources available for um, students who just might need those at that, at that time. So that's a different way of looking at things, mm -hmm. much, much different. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Am I leaving anything else out or not? I don't think so. so. Okay. I think that's kind of your basic introduction to an FBA and uh, we appreciate your 
time and questions. There are a few things I, I'm going to leave with um, ingrained in my mind, and that's the rule of three, mm -hmm. and also to do the direct observation. Uh, I appreciate all of the detail that you provided for the functional behavioral assessment and then the behavior support plan. As a director of student services, I can very clearly see how having a team and being aware of the FBA and the behavior support plan will allow students to be safe, engage in school, and stay in that least restrictive environment, which is key for any student. So I'm excited to take this the next step with staff, and I'm also very excited for other points you've noted, such as the classroom-wide mm -hmm. um, approach, and even looking at our schedules to look for when our movement breaks occur. So a lot of terrific information provided. I appreciate the time from both of you today. So take that approach in your school, that functional behavioral analysis and behavior support plan or something that you can do, whether you're big or small, have your team come together, use the resources that have been provided um, through the Great Lakes Summit, and you'll be in terrific shape. So again, I appreciate your time today. Best